Hey, Tim, got back from your moose hunt. Congratulations on the moose, man. Thank you, buddy. And uh, folks, if you want to learn more about uh, potentially going on a moose hunt, um, this in this case in Canada, and the preparation and all the things that go with it, please uh, stay tuned because we've got the episode for you. Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses, a podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Hey, if you like what these two dumbasses are doing, please hit the like button and subscribe today. So, Bud, why don't you go? Let's go into intros and uh, let's start with you. How long you been hunting? And hey, was this your first hunt, moose hunt? So, been hunting for you know about 15 years, 16 years. Didn't really start until I met Phil um, back in uh, in Colorado. Really, I met him in North Dakota. But didn't start hunting until Colorado. This was my first moose hunt experience and my first uh, hunt outside of the United States. So for me, a lot of firsts. I wish there was a first moose kill tag in there too, but um, it will come. Hopefully it will come. All right. Uh, Steve. Well, uh, I've been hunting for 50 plus years now. Uh, not my first moose hunt. I hunted in Newfoundland in 2010 and got a moose there, got a bull there. Uh, of course, you don't bring much back from that hunt. You know, you bring back enough for a taste and a, set of, and a rack and away you go. Uh, this moose that I got was considerably bigger. They're, they're actually smaller there, I think. Uh, racks are, everything we saw was less developed. So for our area, I think it was a bit, in Newfoundland, I think it was a bit over hunted in that area. Uh, and also, well, it's actually my second hunt out of the country. I hunted doves in Argentina in 2009. And that was incredible also. All right, Phil. Well, so I, I started hunting when Steve was 50. And so I've been at it for a little over 40 years now. Um, this is my first hunt. Uh, that was a guided hunt and my first hunt um, out of the United States. Um, up till now, almost all of my hunting has been on public land. Um, so this was also my first time where we basically had uh, sole private access to hunt. So some unique experiences there for me. Okay. Uh, so what types of hunting have you guys done? And, you know, let's start with you, Steve. Uh, in my, it, starting in Northern Minnesota, basically every type of upland game here in Western North Dakota, Wyoming, uh, some in Colorado, uh, waterfall in Minnesota and Dakotas, deer, antelope in Wyoming, mule deer in North Dakota, white-tailed deer in North Dakota, moose, like I said before, in Newfoundland and elk in Colorado. How about you, Phil? So I, I consider myself a bow hunter. I, I started bow hunting when I was 15. Uh, I, I killed my first year when I was 13 with a rifle. But um, as I got into my high school years, I, the way I like to put it is I wasn't good enough to kill one in the short rifle season. I needed the whole three months of archery season to have a chance. Um, so I, I kind of, for many years, uh, probably... 15 plus years, I was solely archery. And when I actually moved back to Nebraska in 2004 is when I really started getting back into to rifle hunting. Um, kind of like Steve, I've, I've hunted everything from squirrels and rabbits and dove and duck, uh, turkey, antelope, elk, deer, mule deer, um, you name it. Um, I like to hunt it. That's awesome. And you shot, uh, you're, uh, you're also turkey hunt with a bow too. Is that right? Um, I did just get a turkey a few days ago with my bow. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I, I, I do a lot of uh, turkey in the fall, which most people do turkey in the spring. Um, but I'm busy fishing in the spring. So I usually wait until fall to get my turkey. How about you, bud? I've, 
primarily have been a, a deer hunter in the time that I've hunted and, and uh, hunted quite a bit of waterfowl. Uh, I, I did do a lot of archery hunting and still do that. But when I do it, it's more like hiking through the mountains with a bow. I've had very limited success on elk uh, over the years, but I do enjoy it very much. But primarily those. I've tried a lot of different types of hunting. I'm a little red, green, colorblind. So some of the upland game hunting, bird identification is tough for me. Um, same kind of thing, have to study a little bit for waterfowl or have somebody close to me that knows then that, that can help, help call and identify for me. Uh, cause I have trouble, uh, picking them out a lot of times, um, especially between, uh, the males and females. You know, the guidance I've always been told with, when it comes to elk hunting is, Hey, you don't pass up your legal bull. The first, first bull, you get an opportunity to take a shot at, you take a shot at, cause you never know. I mean, you just, you never know if you're going to see him again. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough. And I, I, I agree completely. Um, I've had some bad luck on a few, uh, missed a few, uh, you know, for different reasons. But like any hunting, you know, it's always a the, the first four or five years, I was probably making way too much noise to ever get close to one. And then as you learn, you know, you get better. Uh, one of these days, I'll, I'll get that big one. I don't know about you guys. I've hunted a lot with this guy. And and uh it seems like something's always going to happen when I'm hunting. Always. It's always something. And I, I feel like in the end, I am going to be the smartest hunter out there. Now, I won't have anybody to share that knowledge with, but by the there will be a day to where I am going to be yeah. the smartest hunter that's out there. You're well, saying that if you learn through mistakes, you're going to be yeah. like a professional. Yeah, I, I really do. <laughs> I mean, you've seen them, right? I mean, you've lived them. <laughs> Well, you can't be that bad because you're not a full-scale vegetarian. So, <laughs> thank God for grocery stores. <laughs> so, so how did you guys go about finding a place to hunt, or what led you to you guys to think about moose hunting? And let you know, let's start with Phil. So, back in the early '90s, when I was stationed uh, up there by Steve in Grand Forks, North Dakota. I was archery hunting whitetails a lot, and I, I got to bumping into moose and actually had opportunity to call a couple of bull moose right underneath my stand. And, of course, didn't have a tag for them, but really, really enjoyed it. And so I knew then someday that I was going to do a moose hunt. Um, it was just a matter of finding the right place and finding a time when I could do it. And I, I looked at some opportunities there in Ontario to do a combination fishing slash moose hunt trip. And I passed on those in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. And then I started looking seriously again about three or four years ago. And what I really wanted to do was an Alaska moose hunt. Um, I, I wanted to do a float trip. But when you start looking at that, those trips have gotten... Um, outrageously expensive and so they were out of my budget and so that started me looking in, into areas that might fit my budget um, more so but still give me an opportunity to get a, a good size moose um, something you know 35 inches or or bigger and the area there around Saskatoon and North Battleford has a pretty good reputation for 35 plus inch moose with an opportunity for um, something in the fifties and maybe even close to 60. So the, the price wasn't too bad. Um, also what was appealing about it was we were able to drive. When I looked at some of the Alaska hunts, if you fly, it's really prohibitively expensive to try to fly all the meat back with you. And so most people end up donating it. And uh, I've, I've had moose a few times when I lived there in North Dakota. And my grandpa killed one in northern Minnesota when I was younger. And uh, it was delicious. So I wanted to be able to bring some moose meat back for um, the family and to share with some friends. And so that meant really finding a place that you could drive to. And while it's not an easy drive, um, it is within driving distance, and, and that's kind of what led me to, to the area there in Saskatchewan that, that we chose to hunt. So, Steve, Bud, do you have anything else to add? Oh, camaraderie. I mean, that's it. Time with friends. 
you know, and he asked for asked for YMOs just because it was next on the list again, yeah. you know. But the time with the friends and and uh, all the good natured kidding that I received. <laughs> But I'll be okay. I didn't think they were kidding, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I have a case I don't care. So I'll use different wording as that than I normally would, but I'm just feeling bad about it, but I'll get over it. Bud, you got anything to add? No, I would just say I'm always looking for a new, you know, experience. Uh, and not just in hunting, but in life. I enjoy, you know, trying to do things, you know, I've, I've Jumped out of planes. I've done some other things. I haven't done them a bunch of times, but, uh, you know, something new and different that we hadn't done before. Uh, but I would say Steve's right. That the most important thing is this is an excuse for us to get together and spend week uh, with, with our good friends. Yeah, awesome. So moving on, I'm going to start with you, Phil. How, how did you guys go about finding a place to hunt moose? How, how do you go about finding this place? Um. So I'll, I'll tell you, I, I record a lot of outdoor channels and I, I watch a lot of them in particular looking for places that other people are going um, that seem to be popular. And then I, I went from there into some online research. And, and what I would say is um, there's a lot of information out there, but I found that a lot of it is not very useful. Um, there's, a lot of overhyping of, of what can be expected on a hunt. Cause you know, in, in the end, most of these places are salesmen. And so um, until you give them your money, um, they're trying to sell you on a dream that you're chasing. Right. Um, and then, so early on, you'll, you'll hear a lot about, Oh yeah. You know, 90% success, a hundred percent success. 100% opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, like we found uh, the first day when we met our outfitter up there, who we had never talked to before because of, of different circumstances, we had talked to basically a broker. Um, one of the first things he said to us is, hey, these are, these are wild moose. There's no guarantee. Um, you know, you're going to have to hunt for what you get. Um, so... The, the amount of information um, that's out there online, I, I didn't find very useful. Um, what I would say was useful was I found a, a couple of references that I was able to call and talk to. And um, I would just uh, caution that the references that outfitters are going to give you are going to be people that were successful and had a pleasant experience. Um, because again, they're trying to sell you on something. So you, you kind of keep that in mind as you're talking to those folks that, that their outcome was, um, most generally a successful outcome. Um, but what I was looking for was not necessarily a guarantee of a success rate or anything like that. I was looking for a type of hunt that I wanted to do. And for the moose hunt, even though I'm at heart a, a bow hunter, I had decided early on that when I went for moose, I wanted to do it with the rifle and I wanted to be comfortable with, with long range shooting if I had to be. And uh, that central part of Saskatchewan has a lot of wheat fields and I had been through there on fishing trips before and I knew what the terrain looked like. And I, I felt like that the way that the terrain was going to lay out, that it would afford me an opportunity for spot and stock with a rifle. And so once I kind of narrowed down into that area, then it was just a matter of, of selecting who you were going to hunt with. And that's where if you go to look at a lot of these um, outfitters online, you can't find a lot of information uh, about them. Um, you can't find a lot of information about exactly where they're hunting or that kind of thing. So um, you, you kind of have to piece together your understanding of the geography of the area. Um, the places that they mentioned to you, take a look at that and, and see if it fits the style of hunting that you want. Um, what we ended up on in this hunt is instead of hunting the wheat fields, we ended up going a little bit farther north into um, a more wooded and hilly area. And uh, growing up in, in south central Missouri, that 
that was something I was comfortable hunting. So once we got to that area, um, I loved it. And as soon as I started seeing pictures of the area, um, I knew I was going to love that kind of hunt. Um, but that's what I was really looking for, something that fit kind of my style of hunting. So, Bud, Steve, do you have anything you want to add? References, references, references. I mean, don't you, I mean, I think as a, as a hunter and a, and a, a businessman, businessman myself, I look for references to know that the people I'm dealing with are reputable, quality, and in all honesty, truthful. You know, I think that even though some people may be rep reputable, in the long run, sometimes truth escapes some things. I know that I really enjoyed the time with the guide that we did end up with in the end. And think I actually think the world of the guy. I, he's a nice man. He's a good person. He's talented. He understands. And he's concerned about the, about the, the moose herd itself and making sure that he ma helps manage the moose herd in his area. You know, and we spoke with him. What impressed me is he said, nobody shoots a cow here, not out of my camp. He said, if, if for every cow you shoot, you eventually take about 100 animals out. And I really thought that was a good thing to hear. So what was the criteria for selecting an out outfitter? And Phil, I, I put you to start with because I think you, you kind of led that search. So I got, I'm starting with you. And if I've got that wrong, you guys chime in. Um, yeah, so the, the criteria that I used, um, you know, go, goes back to the, the style of hunting that I was looking for. Um, and I, I got references and I called some folks that had hunted um, with the gentleman that we originally booked with. And, of course, that was pre-COVID. And um, our hunt got put off a couple years because of COVID. And the outfitter that we were originally scheduled with was um was um inflicted with covid and ended up having to get out of the guiding business he he never quite recovered fully from the covid and the the folks that i had talked to were very impressed with with that gentleman so um the hub broker that i had used to book the hunt um when i talked to him he moved me to a, a di different outfitter and I asked him, you know, this, this was a late, a late development. So our hunt was in September um, or the first week of October. Um, he didn't tell me that he was having to switch us until probably late July, August. And so I asked questions, you know, about, you know, what, what about this new guy you're moving us with? Is he good, et cetera? And, you know, he talked, he talked him up um, really well and gave me a level of comfort with going with this other gentleman. Um, so I was like, that's fine. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, we waited two years. We're, we're ready to go. We'll go. Um, and then we ended up not hunting with this gentleman. Um, he, I would say in the August time frame. I saw some posts that he had posted on Facebook commenting about how he had booked more clients than he'd ever booked before. And that he, uh, was, you know, asking for people to pray for him that, or that, you know, that he did well and that sort of thing. And so that immediately raised a red flag with me. And so I started calling and talking with the other gentleman and saying, Hey, you know, I've got some concerns here. Um, I'm worried that this guy is over hunting his area, that he's overbooked, that he's not going to be able to, to uh, give us a good hunt and that sort of thing. And that kind of resulted in us getting um, moved over to the, to the gentleman we actually hunted with. And um, I, I would echo what Steve said. Um, and, and something that I've always said is even a blind squirrel finds a net every once in a while. Um, I, I think that was the case uh, with, with Nathan. Um, I think we were very fortunate that we got to hunt with Nathan. Uh, he, uh, he took us to an area that I absolutely loved. Um, 
we did a camping type of hunt as opposed to a hunt from a hotel and drive around and do spot and stock, which we had initial, originally planned. Um, I like that way better than what we had initially been signed up for. Um, so, yeah, so, so references were, were big, and, and then we just kind of got lucky in the end, I think. Yeah, I, I'll just add add something here. Um, a, a mistake that I think I made that uh, maybe can help some some other folks. Um, once the hunting season starts, the the guides and the outfitters are overwhelmed with whoever is in camp that week. They don't have time to be um, putting attention toward the guys that are coming the next week or two weeks out or three weeks out. And I, I had a hard time getting answers to a lot of my questions once they were in camp and hunting. And, and some of that is they have limited cell phone service. So they may only get to their cell phone every two or three days. Um, so I would recommend if you do something like this, that you want to come up with a list of questions and things that you think you want to know. And you want to ask those in the early summer before they get busy with their other clients. And I, I think it's also respectful to the other clients that while they're out there trying to get somebody else on a moose or a deer or elk or whatever they're guiding, that, that you're not bothering them with their phone ringing all the time, um, that they can actually focus on their other clients. And, and I think that's what we expect when we're there is that the next group isn't bothering them by calling them all the time. And, and so I think if you do that, um, if you think ahead, you'll, you'll get better answers to your questions and you'll be better prepared in the end. Yeah, good. That's a good one. So uh, moving on, you know, going to, and I think we might have even answered this, but how do you guys think overall this, this worked out for us? And I'll start with Bud. Well, it worked out better for some of us than others from a tag perspective, right? Um, <laughs> That, uh, but that's always, you know, that's why they call it hunting and not killing, right? So um, I think in the end, it was a great camp. Nathan and his guys were great. Um, would have liked to have seen some more experience in a couple of the guides that helped uh, Nathan. Uh, but, but I think it was fantastic from that perspective. Um, I had some technical phone challenges. <laughs> up there i've since gotten a new phone so be prepared when you head up to the great white north uh i i was daily ticked off because everybody else's phone seemed to work and mine didn't uh so that's a, a mistake that i made that i won't make again for sure uh but i i thought it was great um the the people that guided us were fantastic and then i, I really thought everyone we met in canada was great too um the one gal when phil and i were leaving that uh you know on on friday we were trying to find a hotel. Apparently all the hotels in Canada fill up every single day. There's never a vacancy. And we were calling around and this gal at, at one of the hotels um, actually called a whole bunch of other hotels to find a place for us. And finally she called us back and she said, I can't find anything. So I'm going to go clean one of these rooms where somebody just left. It won't look pretty, but it'll be clean and you can stay here. So, uh, which was fantastic. So the people were great. Experience was great. Um, but uh, there are some challenges when you get up there. Yes, yeah, Steve, Steve, Phil, you got anything to add? Well, I, I'd have to agree with Bud on the fact that when we were in camp, I, I thought the guys that, that uh, Nathan had, though a couple of them were new to it, they were very good, very polite, courteous. They were fun to be around. It was a good time. Nathan did a, an exceptional job for us. And, and in all honesty, he basically took us on as a as an after his group hunt. I would have to agree that would be the way it would be. You know, I mean, he had already filled all his tags, and it, he ended up helping out the other outfitters so that we could continue to hunt. He told me, he said, "I don't want to see you guys go home without without getting to hunt." And he was a great opportunity to go hunting, and I will go back. Yeah, Phil, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I agree, obviously, with, with what the guys are saying there. Um, you know, Steve, um, and, and you probably, you have a little different perspective because 
uh, you were able to get a moose right off the bat, um, Steve, not too long after. I, I didn't see a moose until the last day of the hunt. But I, I got to tell you, every time I went out, I felt like that I was right on top of moose. Um, you know, there, there were some weather challenges and um, that kind of slowed things down, I think. Um, but I, I think that the guides were, were putting us in an area where we were, were likely to see moose and, and get a moose. Um, so I was real happy with that. Um, I, I love the camp setup. Um, it was very primitive. So um, that might be worth um, talking through depending on what kind of camp you would like. Um, I, I could see that there would be folks who would not like a camp that primitive. Um, but I absolutely loved it. Um, I couldn't have asked for a, a better camp. Well, our restroom, um, our restroom had a great view, didn't you think? It did. It the washroom did. had an awful, had a wonderful window to the world. <laughs> um, I, I could have probably had a better roommate, but um, <laughs> yeah, when you bring him with you, you know what? <laughs> you can't complain about that. Yeah. Well, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. You know, the Roby is there. Sometimes you get the short straw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to, yeah, the, that, you know, hunting licenses. Why don't you guys talk about were the hunting licenses part of part of the package? And let's not talk export tags just yet. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the way that most of the hunts that I looked at were set up is the, the price that they advertise includes your hunting license. Um, it includes airport pickup at, at Saskatoon. It includes your lodging and food for the week. And it includes airport drop-off back in Saskatoon after your hunt. So it, it's really an all-inclusive package. Um, it was also a one-on-one -on -one guided package. Um, I, I know that there are some that do a one-on-two guided package, and those are a little bit cheaper, but quite frankly, um, it's, it's a very minor difference in cost between the one-on-one the -on -one and the one-on-two, so I, I would certainly recommend doing the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and the, the guys that we hunted with, I, th I think, taught us a lot. Um, one of the things that I'll say that I, I didn't think to ask this, until the very end of the hunt when I was talking to Nathan and I said, Hey, you know, um, I'm coming back next year and I'm coming back the next year after that. I would like to go try to call them on my own and do a self-guided hunt. Is that something that's acceptable with you? And he was like, Oh yeah, we, we have guys that do that um, a lot that want to come up and just do it by themselves. So if you want to come out and go out on your own and hunt on your own, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, I, I wish I would have known that early on. Um, but what I learned from his guides, the days that I hunted with them, I think will prepare me so that next year when I go up, I, I will feel comfortable going out and doing a self-guided hunt. I just got to learn how to call. Well, there, there is always the fact that you can use an electronic call if you want. There are several different models for that. You know, I, I guess I yep. haven't thought about that, but there definitely is. Yeah, I've done some research and I've already identified um, a, a good candidate for a uh, automatic call. And, um, you know, I, I think Bud actually has more of an act for calling than I do. And so... You know, it might be a situation where you do, where you team up and two of you go out and I can let Bud call me and Moose in and then I can hang back at camp while he goes and gets his own. <laughs> Seems reasonable to me. I guess I'd, I'd be right there with that. You know, I'm sure by then I'll have already finished up my hunt so I can entertain you and, you know, while Bud goes up, tracks no. down a wily moose and comes back with one. <laughs> That the, the electronic call raises an interesting question, though, and I, I don't know if you guys want to get into it, but I know they can use electronic calls because they're First Nation folks. They're hunting on First Nation land. But is it OK for us to use 
electronic calls if we were going to do an, a self-guided hunt on their land? I, I don't know if that's if that's the case or not. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.